So now, now that we've broached the uh, the topic of uh, collaborating collaboration between financial institutions and fintechs, we're, we're going to bring several players together to discuss this this very point about how how to promote this uh, in in the future. So we've got panelists from representatives from a major bank, from a, a tools provider, from uh, a, a marketplace, uh, the Apex marketplace, as well as a company that um, a fintech that is actively uh, partnering with financial institutions. So um, I'm going to welcome uh, Zenon Capron, the founder and director of, of Capron Asia, to the stage, who's uh, uh, agreed to moderate this panel. And I'm, I'm very pleased, Zenon, uh, that um, that I've, I've got you to. Um, uh, to, to bring us this uh, panel, um, I, I know from your your work and uh, and Capron Asia's uh, research in the financial services region uh, in, um, sector in in Asia that this is uh, this is something that uh, you you can um, uh, can contribute a lot to. So thanks, uh, th and I will let you um, take over and uh, and introduce our panel. Great. <laughs> thanks, John, and thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon for this panel. I think when we look at the uh, future of financial institutions and fintech collaboration, it's it's useful to look at the past. And, and from my memory, it's about 2014, 2015, that the word fintech started to be used more frequently uh, at events like Cybos. And initially, the feeling was that, hey, these fintechs are going to come and eat the lunch of the banks. And, and CB Insights most famously did a, a beautiful image of the Wells Fargo website that was being disintermediated by uh, a couple hundred fintech companies. But really, the market has changed dramatically since then. And we're seeing a lot more collaboration between the financial institutions and the fintechs that are there in the marketplace. And so really, that's what we want to explore on this call is kind of set the context of what have the drivers been for this collaboration? Where is it? Where has it been? Where is it going? And, and what does that mean for the participants in the market? And as John mentioned, we have a great panel lined up for today uh, with uh, Sebastian from Standard Charter, Manish from AFIN, Nick from Thought Machine, and Laurent from a better trade-off. And really to kind of set the stage, maybe it's it's good to look at the drivers that are uh, pushing forward with kind of this collaboration between fintechs and financial institutions. And uh, Nick, let me start with you. Uh, from your perspective, I mean, Thought Machine works with a lot of players within the marketplace. Maybe you can start off, firstly, give a brief introduction on yourself and about Thought Machine, but then talk a little bit about the drivers that you're seeing from your clients on this collaboration between financial institutions and fintechs. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Alan. So, uh, hello, everybody. My name is Nick Wild. I'm the Managing Director of Thought Machine in Asia Pacific. Um, very, very briefly, Thought Machine is a UK fintech that has built uh, uh, a cloud native, cloud agnostic, 100% microservice API enabled core banking platform. So very, very, very different to the core banking uh, models that we've we've seen before. And perhaps some of that will come out if it's if it's illustrative or useful. In terms of drivers, I mean, I think it is worth talking about uh, or lining it up with why Paul Taylor, our founder, started the company. Um, and it was because as he came out of Google and all of the, the lessons that he'd learned in Google, he was utterly convinced that the next the next level of, of customer experience or the next generation of customer experience was going to be generated around artificial intelligence. Now, today, you know, that's not such a big kind of deal. But five, six years ago, when when he started that, you know, he was he was definitely Kind of one of the forward thinkers as he engaged with banks around this what he found was that obviously any any ai model machine learning is as good as the data that it receives um, and every time they built a model and tried to do something cool and creative it stopped at the core right the large black box that said you know i give you data every 30 days and you know i will i will tell you the data you get and you don't get it any any other way so that, that's really where sort of thought, thought Machine came from. So, you know, the idea of convergence of a number of main things, a continuing need to cut costs, especially 
in, in light of low interest environment and COVID impact and all those sorts of things. I mean, that's been accelerated. So taking advantage of the cloud and the open source stack, um, increasing competition from traditional and non-traditional organizations and, and thus having to radically improve the customer experience. And then the, the increasing mainstream. I mean, cloud is mainstream now. APIs are mainstream. Board members are talking about them. So that's how mainstream it is. Um, uh, so how do we how do we sort of stitch all this together and how do we help banks, large or small, um, fintechs, you know, new or, or established to, 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 to leverage that technology to, you know, to, to increase their competitiveness? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, you, you, I, I think back to my time at Citibank, which now is uh, 15, 20 years ago, and, and really as, as an IT, as somebody who was managing IT teams, you know, the, the focus was clearly on how can we reduce cost. It wasn't, it wasn't about how to drive revenue or create solutions to actually enable, but, you know, how could we, how could we cut costs? And arguably, with the things that you've mentioned, Nick, with cost cutting, competition, mainstreaming, it's. Uh, those those are those are key drivers in the way that we're moving forward with things that are enabling these changes and 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 a, a different kind of conversation that we're having. Uh, Laurent, I want to come to you. I mean, do those drivers that Nick mentioned do they resonate with you and what you're seeing from your clients? <clears throat> yeah, very much so. I mean, uh, the cost uh, element is, is critical, and it's not just critical because you you want to be more efficient per se, but because you need to serve many more people. So one of the big issues, if you take the area where we, we try to work, where better, uh, better trade off was founded, I was, I'm one of the founders. The question we had is, we realized that the engagement when it comes to wealth, life insurance, property, long-term financial topics uh, was mostly still analog. I mean, there is a lot of solution to do transfer, to do uh, look at your credit card, but when it comes to the big important decision, you kind of need advice and the digital element was not there. And so uh, while everybody was talking about robot advisor, we were saying it's good to have products, but it would be even better if people buy them. And, and for a lot of people, it's not the issue of the product, it's the issue of understanding how they have them. And so when we talk about cost, if you look at it, it's very expensive to understand who is your client to be able to explain value proposition and, and to recraft something. And I, I come from you, uh, from a large bank, UBS, in, uh, in the wealth management. And, and you can see how difficult it is to do it. So if you want to bring that to the whole market, you need to really get to a very different structure for your distribution. And I think this is where the digital element uh, become essential because otherwise you're going to focus on a lot of transactional part, but you're going to miss everything which makes life important, which is how do we help people with their big goals? And we didn't want to do that only for a few rich country or a few segments. We wanted to make sure that it's applicable for everybody. So financial inclusion is not just having the product, it's making sure everybody can use them. And, and to use them, they need to understand them. And, and, and that's kind of what resonates with uh, what Nick was saying, uh, absolutely uh, absolutely on the same page. We, we just come from a different angle, but I think this is the magic of cloud and API. It's allowing you to create a very unique experience as a bank or as a financial provider, uh, which is going to be really resonating with your clients and your, your target prospects. And, and for us, because I'm, I'm very happy to report we, we have done that with Star Chartered uh, just in Singapore a few weeks ago and, and Zurich at the same time in Malaysia. And so I'm uh, very happy to be able to collaborate with those large organizations because they have capacities that a FinTech doesn't have, but we can bring something that uh, is going to give them the speed and, and the competitive advantage they're looking at. So cost, very important, but I think the second part was revenue and was also engagement. And that, that's kind of, I think, what is true for most of the new fintechs coming up. It's not just about cost cutting, it's not about scale and speed, it's also about engagement. Yeah, that engagement is really important. I mean, if we focus too much on the technology, we often lose sight of what the customer is actually looking for. And with so many new technologies that are almost technologies for technology's sake, uh, it's very easy to lose lose track of that, that aspect of things. Manish, I want to come to you. I mean. It, You've heard from Laurent and Nick about uh, you know what they're seeing, and Afin is obviously sitting in the middle of a lot of this um, with the work that you're doing. Um, can you well kind of introduce yourself and what Afin is doing, and then and then what you're seeing in terms of the the tactical aspects of collaboration between fintechs and financial institutions? No, thanks, thanks, Anon. Uh, thanks, everyone. 
my name is Manish Tiwan. I am the managing director for uh, ASEAN Financial Innovation Network. We run what we call as the APEX platform, API Exchange, essentially a collaboration platform for fintechs and financial institutions to come together in a fail-safe environment and uh, do the proof of concept that otherwise would take them about six, eight months, cost them a lot of thousands of dollars uh, at a fraction of a price. Uh, we essentially we essentially look at ourselves, you know, uh, from the point of view of democratizing how collaboration is uh, done between uh, a bank sitting in some geography uh, who would otherwise be restricted to a very handful of uh, nominated or or referred to by uh, friends and family fintechs uh, whom they want to work with. Uh, we today host close to about 400 plus fintechs on our platform. And uh, once you post a problem statement with Apex, uh, everybody is available to respond to that, and that number keeps on growing. Uh, I really like the thought which Nick shared. Uh, you know, it's actually being discussed in boardrooms, and I think that's that's one of the key drivers from where the change actually starts. Because you know, I as an innovation manager in some bank uh, may try my level best to do some changes, but if the budget doesn't come in, uh, end of story. It's just it's just a PowerPoint presentation. Right, and and I think uh, that's 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 one of the key pillars of that uh, that shift that that's we that that we are seeing right now. Uh, the other critical part I think is the encouragement uh, and the support that comes from the regulator. Uh, Apex uh, or AFIN is is a is an entity promoted by Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, supported by World Bank, IFC, Mastercard, AMTD, and ASEAN Bankers Association. So we are. We are kind of an embodiment of uh, when, a, when a regulator and a policymaker and, and an association of banks and a payment provider, they come together. How, how can you actually ensure that you are enabling change, not just within your own respective geographies or your own respective uh, circle of influence, but actually across the board, right? We, we, we host close to about 70 plus financial institutions today. And, and they are there with Apex because all of them have a single intention to collaborate. Uh, and, and, you know, I was in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a discussion right before this uh, with Johnny Vijay, who is the innovation head for APAC for BNY Mellon, who happens to be our advisory council members as well. Uh, he said a very pertinent thing and, uh, and you know, is about complementing what you do today. And if if and and I see it that as also a very important pillar. Uh, it's not about competing with somebody. Uh, I'm a bank and you are a fintech. You know we are competing and we were talking about the Wells Fargo image uh, at the beginning. Uh, you know it's about complementing. Is I'm I'm not here to eat into your business, but I'm I can I can do something that I think I I do better, and you can try and test my uh, capabilities using a platform like Apex. And, and actually make a much more informed decision as to whom you want to partner with or who who, who do you think can complement your services. I think those are some of the pertinent points that that uh, uh, that we are seeing uh, in in what we do as Apex. Yeah, providing choice is really critical for 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 this space. Um, Sebastian, let me come to you. I mean, you, you're you're surrounded here by panelists who are all helping you to solve your key business challenges. Um, I mean, maybe you can start off as is what do you see as the key drivers from being sitting within a bank, and then what what do you see as the opportunities? I mean, when you when you look at all the potential areas of collaboration, where where has the rubber hit the road for Standard Chartered, and where do you see the opportunities? Yeah, yeah, very good, 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 good point. Yes, and actually, I think this is my third time on the API days. This time, I decided not to do keynote. I decided really to come to the panel, and this gives me also more dynamics in in this conversation. What I really, really appreciate, and it's great, uh, Sanam, to to set the stage here. Um, you know, on this journey, uh, it was not just like three years now API days, but actually, when I'm reflecting now, especially where we started uh, with um, Standard Charter roughly about four years ago with zero APIs where we are now with what we are going um, there and you know even my responsibilities went far far beyond yes so I think three years ago I remember this technology strategy um, we, we have done the decision um, to go with sort machine in, in a first trial in uh, Hong Kong to build up the bank what is since last year now even productive called Mox Bank and uh, um, it was um, you know 
I will say for three years, a kind of experience to, to, to go there. And I still see in the market, the banks, they still not understand the difference between the APIs and the cloud and all of that. What does it really mean? Yes. So, and uh, I smiled. I have seen now two times you said um, that is good that the board is talking about uh, that. I will say it is good when the board is doing something about that. Um, and uh, let me phrase it, what, what is really now the outcome. And actually, a couple of things came really together uh, quite, quite significantly. Yeah, so it's like um, when I benchmark with other banks and they see, oh, what we have done with Mox banks and so on, they still not get it. They, they just think about, oh, this is just another mobile app. And this is just another, you know, channel, a way how we can do banking. That's not. Yeah? So if you see Mox Bank and that's coming to this open banking, the power of API, the power of cloud and going there is like, and why we have also choose to, to build it from scratch is like, it's 51% standard charter. Yeah? So, and then it's a really a joint venture um, a partnership with other stakeholders and you're coming exactly now to the beauty of these partnerships where you're going with telco industries, where you go with many, many other industries and explore you now the possibilities of financial services in, in a more contextual business. Yes. So, and that is all about, it's not like, oh, now I have a new um, uh, mobile and, you know, that's still sometimes where the banks are lacking is they think, um, and, you know, it's the kind of evolution of architectures. Yes. So it's like uh, they're still in the mindset of mobile first. Yes. So, but actually they still not understand an architecture difference between a mobile first architecture or an API first architecture. Yes. So where actually the mobile is only one channel and one possibility. And when you're going really to the contextual business where actually the API has the strengths is then that you go to the edge you go to the context you 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 explore much much more sensors in in the um, environment so long story short in in this context um, and when i'm reflecting the last three years and yes of course we have done mox bank we are coming now in singapore also with a virtual bank and we we are, we are going this path significantly as um, i will say maybe my best supporter was COVID, um, and uh, um, yeah, we, we um, as I can say, all of this happened driven by business. It's not anymore that we from technology has to convince business to do this. Yeah, so business is convinced that they will say our future business, and I talk about more than 50% of our future business, is based on that. Yeah, so, and that is now when it's coming, what I'm called with doing on, on board level, is like now really significant decisions, significant decisions. So, um, and just coming to, to this point, yes, of course, we have built up access. Yes, we, of course, we have uh, uh, done a lot of exploration how we can really monetize APIs. It's not just a number of APIs. What are the right APIs? Uh, taking the advantage of your business models and all of that and bringing this into this context of that. Yes, so it's not like... Our, our monetization to, to pay for APIs, our monetization is really actually to, to, to really enhance the business, what we are doing today through, through new ways of uh, enabling. So, and uh, to come to the point, yes, so that's why since um, uh, January this year, I took a, a much, much more bigger responsibility because we as Standard Charter has now not just learned how APIs are relevant, we have learned how relevant cloud is, public cloud. Yes, so because when you come to edge, when you're coming to scale, when you're coming, your partners in APIs actually are in the cloud. So you have to do the business there where your partners are and not vice versa. Um, and, and with this uh, context is, uh, we have done this board, this significant decision. Actually, we will further expand this, but at least what, what is today um, uh, in the official communication is, and one of my target is um, by 2025, we will move 75% of our entire workload into public cloud. Yeah, so, and as you can imagine, as a bank, this is a significant decision. Yeah? So this is not just uh, because we're talking about 47 regulators, we are talking about, you know, the footprint in Asia, Middle East, Africa, and uh, actually the entire business. Yeah, so, and uh, the good news for me is like, that's now where it's coming, the fun stuff is like uh, business is coming, 75 is not enough. 
So, and uh, now they, um, but this is great to have. Yes. Yeah? So it's not like that they say, oh, cloud is the technology, API is the technology, I don't care. And so on. It's like, uh, it's more now that they see, oh, I have huge opportunities now, how I can reach. Yes. Yeah? So, in coming out, why I said COVID has helped us is, um, the bank has took seriously now a decision where should be our business in 2025. So, and actually that supports me with all of this technology right now, because I will say if we all of us reflect um, like the last year and how the last 12 months happened, it's like sustainability got a very, very different, um, you know, position. Uh, and also how we want to be good yes so and how we want to really uh, drive the right things forward and uh, it's uh, very very interesting now that um, you know one of the business decision was also um, standard charter is most um, known especially you know, by individual customers for affluent clients and we have done uh, the significant decision we are going also to mass customers so, but now coming to the point, we are not doing mass customers as other banks has done this in the past. And we will not open more branches. No, not at all. Yes. So, but now what does it mean now with this sustainability aspiration, uh, zero carbon footprint, all of this kind of things, what you want to really encourage individuals as corporations um, with this financial services will be a very different way. And yes, as you can imagine, hey, APIs and cloud are, centrally in the middle to do this so that's my introduction i think open the stage and of course uh, i need uh, a lot of lot of help to make it happen All right yeah it's it's interesting the point about the technology so i, I was uh, having a conversation with a friend who runs one of the fintechs here in singapore and i said so what do you think are the top three technologies over the past year and he said uh, apis cloud and COVID. Uh, was the was the top impact on his his business over the past year, listing COVID as a technology. Um, Nick, I, I want to come back to you. I mean, Sebastian brought up a lot of really good points, but one of those was around uh, changing the conversation and and the focus on the customers. Uh, on those two aspects, when you're speaking with clients, how has the conversation changed, and 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 what are you seeing going forward? Again, you know, the technology used to be a conversation just about the technology, but now it's about business strategy, it's about the customer focus. How have you noticed that change in the clients that you work with? So I think, uh, and Sebastian talked about Mox, we're, we're one of the partners that that works with Mox um, and, and Bolt sits at, the, sits at the heart of that. The, the thing that I think was really, really impressive, genuinely impressive about Mox was they, they genuinely started with the customer experience. They went and spent a whole bunch of time talking to customers uh, both of Stanchar and not about what it was they needed, and 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 uh, and then they built a technology stack that had the agility to provide that, as opposed to here's my credit card, here's my app, here's my debit card, here's my loan, here's the thing. You 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 sign for them one by one, and then you work out how it fits your life. What 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 they've done is taken the the capability that ourselves and others of the partners have done. Have, have provided and they have created sure they've created an app with an associated card okay you know lots of people have done that but at, at the point where a you know incredibly rapid re uh, registration b an immediate ecosystem those those kind of things but but upon opening the app um i i get my my current account and i can immediately start to set up savings pots and goals um that are, that are pertinent to me so we're taking they, they, they've taken a big step of, of taking personalization beyond just the app uh, and into how the service fits my my life. Then a matter of months later, the, the debit card that is associated with the, um, with, 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 with the account is instantly a credit card. So what happens is I log on to my app one morning and it says, hey, Nick, do you want, would you like it to be a credit card? And I answer a couple of questions, push the button. There's no, there's no need. The card I've already got in my hand or, or on my mobile now becomes a credit card. So I've got a hybrid debit credit card mere months after I've, you know, after we've rolled what was already an innovative bank out. Um, and I won't 
give the rest away, but in three months' time, there'll be another feature coming out. Three months after that, another feature. And they are significant features, and they are centered around how do these customers want to, 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 to embed finance into their lives. Going beyond that, I think where, where we get to and we come back to you know, why you need API, why you need the cloud, why you need a real-time core like ourselves um, that is fully API enabled, banks, banks will stop being a utility that provides a bunch of services or, or, or even a really customer-centric service and they will start to be a financial partner. They, they've got so much information around us. We've got such great AI now. We've got real-time APIs. You know, I like to think I'm a reasonably smart person and I do an okay job of managing my money. But in all honesty, if there was an exam, I'd be lucky if I got a C because I'm, I'm not really, you know, I'm busy living life sort of thing. Whereas if a bank could say to me, hey, Nick, what's your savings goals? What's your, what's your goals? and then constantly just nudge me, right? And it doesn't have to be, hey, Nick, you really need that Starbucks. It could be, hey, Nick, you know, I see there's $150 left over at the end of this month. You know, why don't we, you know, why don't we put it there? Or why, hey, this new product from one of our FinTech partners is now in the ecosystem. We think it suits you, you know, brilliantly, that kind of thing. So I think, you know, APIs and and the, and the, the cloud and real time and, and all of this cool technology just, just accelerates and integrates into the, the improved customer e experience. Yeah, that, that point about, I mean, it's almost the gamification. Um, this conversation that I was having earlier today with a wealth tech uh, B2B provider here in Singapore, they were talking about how the, in, in Singapore, something that's particularly resonant with the the consumers is comparisons. So, you know, even down to a, a thing that says, you know, of people that live in Tanjong Pagar, you are saving 20% less and that that especially in this kind of environment in Singapore you know people are very comparative and and you always want to be the best and so that that drives a lot of this as well um Manish I want to come back to you in in, in terms of apex and the the demand that you're seeing around this what what are the key APIs and the key areas that that you're seeing both providers and requestors I guess you would say come to the platform for no uh so then, uh, you know, Apex, uh, Apex is a platform which talks to a lot of financial institutions across the board. Uh, we talk to banks which are servicing a very small geography in the, uh, rather a community in, in say, Philippines uh, to, to global giants like DBS, CT, HSBC, etc. And everybody has a different, uh, different demand set, right? Uh, what we saw, and and I think you know uh, uh, Sebastian and uh, talked about it as well, uh, which is that COVID angle, and 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 I think that was the essential pivot that we saw uh, in 2020, uh, where we have seen a lot of demand being generated for basic things, you know, digital customer onboarding, digital S, digital uh, credit, uh, SME lending, and so on and so forth, because you know they were there's there are almost you know 75 to 80 percent of the financial institution which are not not in the top tier they were really left behind suddenly out of the blue covid hit them right there were no there were no agents going out in the field filling up forms no branches uh, no call centers uh, you know no no nobody doing credit uh, nobody writing camp papers and so on and so forth now suddenly suddenly there's this lull and and the bank is suddenly feeling that heat of not being digital and they were not digital not because they didn't want to be digital because they were there's a, there's a lack of resource right you need money to go digital you you need to have a core banking system which is able to connect to a thought machine or any of the other uh, any of the other fintechs and 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 you know api uh, api stack to actually work on a, on a on a on a regular basis now, what we are seeing is that, you know, there's a growing demand uh, for basic things, you know, digital KYC, digital lending, uh, alternate credit, uh, risk, AML, uh, uh, regulatory reporting, and so on and so forth. While on the other hand, uh, you know, because because every, every geography is now getting into uh, digital banking license, which are specific to, uh, to certain set of uh, 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 applicants, and and that's essentially growing the 
the so to speak you know the turf war between the the larger uh, incumbents and and the new age digital banks whom we know are very proficient in their their work as we do as they do for their current businesses and and there is no reason why a large bank would not feel uh, the heat of it right so there is a large demand coming from from the larger banks uh, who are looking at optimizing cost right who are looking at at doing things better than what they were doing today or who are looking at doing things faster than what they are doing today you know in in an average bank today uh, it takes about 6 to 8 months before you get to a point where you where you are ready to do a proof of concept right on apex you could do the same thing in a matter of days now to reduce something that you were taking 6 8 months or maybe you know 250000 to do it in a matter of 8 to 10 days is something is something of a lot of interest to a lot of people especially those who have the resources right so because you know you you will end of the day need some you know some tech work to go into it you will end of the day need to have the capability to integrate faster quicker better with these fintechs right so those are you know we talk to like i said you know we talk to people across the board and different people have different requirements so so those are some of the requirements that we see uh, more often No. Got it. That's great. Uh, Sebastian, I mean, and Manish brought up a good point and and he didn't outright say it necessarily, but I mean, legacy infrastructure and you said that standard charter 75% going to cloud in the future. I mean, what are you going to do with those mainframes in the back end and how is standard charter um tackling those challenges with the legacy infrastructure and this this move to a more digital uh agile front end? Yeah, a very good question. Yes, and of course, yes, of course, with our uh, you know history, more than uh, um, I, sorry, I apologize, but I think more than 160 years, depending also by the markets. Um, so is um, yeah, we have still a couple of different core banking systems. When you're coming to the credit card systems, um, there are at least two uh, we have still on 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 mainframe, but the workload is quite. Um, not so significant anymore so and uh, there were also a couple of uh, key decisions in the last three years so one is as i said the mox example is uh, is one of this uh, uh, experience what we started to see how how this is going and uh, was actually a, a good experience there and uh, learning a lot what means really to be in cloud what means to uh, to build this api first architectures etc um now um in that sense also we have done during this time we are not sleeping we we have done also significant decisions for example one the replacement of our core banking system yes so um and it was more uh, i will call it now we we have different rs yes so the the core banking system i put this under the replatforming so actually in my current role every two every month we are bringing two new markets on um, on public cloud this is replatformed core banking system what is now completely on open stack um and um, that is how we also then replace uh, the last mile mainframe what is still um, you know there in in two markets thailand and um, and uh, hong kong um but uh, this is what is happening yeah so just uh, last week we we went live in oman Yeah, so it's like you have to consider this like not just by the market size it's also considered by how we educate the, um, the the regulator how we are getting with our core banking systems there into the public cloud and so on but nevertheless this is exactly what is happening with this replatforming so and we tackled with the core banking and by 2025 we will have at least in core banking no um no mainframe anymore um and then it's also Uh, the other r is like the rearchitecturing also in the last uh, two years we have done um, uh, a significant investment that we rebuilt payment yes yeah, so we 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 really started in the way um, especially with this cloud first apis uh, you know uh, designed um, that um, was what is the most important apis to be very clear uh, because all of the other have dependencies but what matters with banking is that at the end the transactions and what we learned with all of that is like nothing against the mainframe is very reliable really very resilient a lot of lot of great examples there but it's not scaling enough 
And in the world where we are going with the API demands, with this contextual business, it's by factors higher how we have to proceed transactions and payments specifically because our most prominent API is still payment. Um, and uh, this is where we, we, we really went this road that we said, what is quite un unusual for a bank that we said, okay, we start with the design of the payment system. And the first, what you should not start is the database. Because usually when you design an application, the database and the banking system is in the middle and then you build everything around. And we said, no, we don't want to start with the database first. Uh, we want to really start with uh, what means streaming, what means now the payment flow and all of this kind of things. And yes, of course, we build it completely different. Yes, on a very, very different way how to, 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 to scale payment across in this kind of new ecosystem with cloud, with partners, with APIs and so on. Yes, so where, uh, you know, monitoring is playing a very, very different area because now you're not talking about UIs. You're talking about now, you know, the APIs and the partnerships will be very, very different in that way, how to interact with them. So, yes, so coming back to that, to your question, um, with the current push and target, and I, I think it's both. Yes, so number one, yes, we, we identified which are the core elements and to go to a new stack. So re-architecture, re-platform, redesign. So a couple of these elements. Um, and that is more like the technology angle to drive this. Um, on the other side, and that's coming back to the what you also cited as the third one, the COVID, is, um, um, you know, the as I said, our business wants to have 50% new business by 2025. And this means completely new business. Yes. So, and this new business, so then 50% of our revenue helps me because they are going right away on the new technology. So then um, actually one of the biggest challenge for a bank is actually not to create new stacks, not to create like mocks and so on, new, new business models. The biggest problem with the bank is to uh, you know, just to actually sunset systems to really um, also close in some sense some business. Yes, yeah? so significantly what you see in in Standard Charter, yeah, uh, we we closed a lot of branches. Yes, yeah? so we we have done significantly changes, and not just in Singapore, where we are saying okay, uh, that impact maybe our current business in some sense. But uh, with, with the vision where our business wants to go, um, we, we might create now new legacy. Yes, so, uh, but it's a, a different way of that. Yes, so that uh, we are saying, okay, good. Uh, this is the way where we see the future of the next uh, you know, decades uh, should be the contextual banking. But I want to make one point. One point, I think, uh, we are not the best uh, uh, to answer all these questions. Um, I, I loved one conversation with our CEO. Is um, he said with the new way where we are going with APIs, with uh, cloud, with all of that, he's not afraid anymore of shadow IT, because actually that's the purpose of that. Because now uh, with cloud, they don't, they should not need IT because everything is in the cloud. Then yes. So, but where he's afraid of shadow business. Yeah, so and I want to make the point, and I think this is really the serious point to that is like we sometimes as technologists, and yes, we are proud building some APIs, yes, we are proud to do some of this technology. We still not understand business. Yeah, so and I want to really say this, even if you are thinking, oh yes, we are digital, oh yes, we are doing that. Uh, there are still other people who should tell us this should be the business when we talk about sustainability and when we talk about banking and all of that. And, you know, I think these roles are still relevant that with the whole digitization, uh, we are not coming into this vice versa that we are saying, oh, now we are creating shadow business in, uh, you know, when we are building this and this. And uh, um, that's a, a good wake up call sometimes uh, to keep this in mind to say, okay, look, there's still regulation. There's still uh, a lot of elements in, in banking. What needs to be considered doesn't matter if you're not digital or if you're going on blockchain, if you're going in, you know, whatever kind of financial services. And there are other people smarter than technologists to, to do these decisions. 
Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, that that uh, Laurent, I'd, I'd like to come to you on that point. I mean, uh, Sebastian brought up a really good point about risk and and the challenges around that. I mean, what what have you seen uh, both for your business and and for your clients' businesses around the risk side of things? Because, you know, as as we have gone more digital over the past year, uh, one consequence of that is all of a sudden all of these new attack factors are opened up, both you know the 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 technology attack factors as well as uh, you know phishing and everything else I, I've, re I've received more phishing text messages over the past year and and cheap loan whatsapp messages than I ever have before I mean how how are how are you and then clients looking at addressing that risk and the risk challenge that a lot of these new platforms new technologies and apis present so I, I think that's a, a very good point regarding the risk aspect uh, that's usually a place where when I observe um, or colleagues in other fintech, uh, if you don't take it from, from day one, it's going to be difficult to plug it back into your solution. So coming from the industry, uh, I had to face this because I was trying to help nurture uh, fintech to come and, and work with the bank where I was working before. And I knew how difficult it is to uh, not only get a POC, but then to get into a place where you deliver large scale in multiple countries with a lot of regulation and risk is only one aspect. There are multiple types of risk. And there's the privacy risk, there's the security risk, there's compliance risk, legal risk, reputational risk, you name it. And I think that that's where the, the um, when we talk about architecture, uh, I, I was listening and I was like, yes, there's a few, few elements which make it difficult for fintech and financial institution to work together because most fintech don't understand the level you need to deliver. Now, that's the kind of investment you need to do from day one. And we spent three years to have a solution which is not only scalable, and that means you take financial planning and you try to apply to every country with the different rule, tax, and so on forth, but also making sure that your solution will be robust and flexible. And what I mean by that is, uh, Stanchal is a great example. You guys are going to the cloud and we're very happy about it because it makes my life much easier, to be very clear. And so I know that some countries are more advanced than others, but the reality is you cannot ignore legacy. And so when you develop your solution and you're trying to develop a, an innovative solution, it's not just a visible part. It's also the way you architect your solution so that it becomes flexible, yes, and the control. Okay, so typically, for example, uh, you could have uh, first data, for example, that's one key element, uh, where the data, how they are used and so on forth. So there's a lot of non-technical consideration which are related to regulation, but not only that, how people perceive the usage of data. Is it, a, is it a, within, a, I would say, the natural expectation? Would you explain that to your grandmother? Should, would she be horrified or she would be okay with it? I think that's that's simple, uh, basic uh, hygiene, but I think it's important. But all the way you structure your solution uh, now with, with microservices, with API, with cloud, allow you to deliver both the kind of scale and agility at the same time. So if in one country you still have a lot of legacy, no problem, still can deliver. And you can follow through as the uh, infrastructure and the setup and the business context also uh, evolve. Because they are so very, the variation in terms of not only the technology landscape, but also the regulatory landscape. And what matters to be successful in the market are, are, are very different. There are things which are universal and there are things that are very specific. And they happen not to be the same all the time. So if you're trying to be one, so you can be the little brick, which is the same for everywhere, and, and that's fine. But if you're trying to have a uh, next level, which I would say is, contextualized banking, what uh, Sebastian was mentioning, or, or Nick, in terms of being able to bring this human interaction inside, you need to integrate the risk from day one. And I think that's the architectural part that many people have great business idea might not cover enough when delivering. And it's not an easy one. And the retrofitting, in my view, uh, is extremely difficult because that's fundamental. As Nick mentioned, if you don't do it from day one, uh, not going to be there. And, and so, it's an easy, it's not an easy sell. It's so much easier to show results immediately, but from a scalability and speed and risk control, that's essential. We would not be able to work with the like of Stanchard or Zurich or other clients we're talking to right now if we were not able to meet the standard and knowing they're going to evolve and they're not going to be easier. That's one thing for sure. The, the trend is very clear. I just want to say the risk is not just technological risk. It's really across the board. 
and, and you have to take it as one. Now, good news, it could be that when you interact better with your client, you also reduce the risk. And that's the beauty of it is that once you start, when we, we try to redefine the standard advisory by making it transparent, by making it natural, by making it customer centric rather than product centric. And when you do that, the benefits of it is you can immediately show the regulator this is based on what we did the advice. This is where the products were available. And, and that's where solution like source machine and the way you embed it and what has Stanchel done with Malt is great because we're talking about a new class of product that you could not get before because you didn't have the information to be able to, uh, to, to make it uh, relevant to your client, but also you didn't have the mechanism to prove that you did it in the right way. Remember, we're in banking, so it's not good enough to be right. We have to prove we did the right thing. And, and I think this is where digital really does it without having all the burden and, and all the pain we have seen uh, on the uh, regulatory aspect for many years before. So that would be my, my answer on risk, a bit larger than what you probably asked, but, but I felt it was important to bring it. Thanks. And that, that, that's great. I, I really like the point about the universal versus the specific. Um, I, I think for risk, that's certainly the case. And and we, we only have a couple minutes left, so maybe I can finish on Sebastian here. And, and another element of universal versus specific is the organizing, uh, organizing for success or the organizational structure that you have in place to enable this fintech cooperation. Maybe to close us out today, Sebastian, can you just talk a little bit about how the standard chartered organization has kind of re going back to your three R's before restructured itself or re-architected itself to, to deal with this, this increasing cooperation? Yeah, a very, very good point. And actually uh, I will um, take the lessons learned also. Business took a lot of, lot of um, exercise there is, um, you know, um, that was like uh, also what I mentioned with the board. Uh, one is talking, the other is doing. So we, we we are still in the process because it's so significant. But since now one and a half years, we started this agile transformation. And so it's really like what are the tribes, squads, chapters, all of this across all of that. But, you know, the beauty of that is not like, okay, I'm reshuffling my technology people. And then I'm creating matrix organization out of that. So the, the beauty of that, now I have a squad where, you know, business, ops, tech, all up together. And then you're coming to compliance and risk and so on. And um, actually one um, uh, interesting part was because this is kind of squads and tribe structure, you are getting more focused, what is great. You are getting really also then uh, more delivery oriented. Um, the, the challenge is usually how you interact across all of them yes so because you are creating in some sense especially with tribes and so on also silos yes so but the beauty of that is apis yes so actually you know when you have every squad with uh, responsible for one api you can scale across like this uh, you know 50000 people as standard charter is that it's not like now okay this is now uh, for 100 people this is really about like across the entire organization what is a very very different scale now, but now you're coming to this where the lessons learned is like um, um, that you are like, if you are a business person now responsible for an API needs education. Yes. So it's, uh, it's not like now anymore to say, oh, I'm, I'm responsible for this uh, credit card and uh, this is now the conditions and how I do it is now I'm responsible for a credit decisioning API. Yes, I'm responsible for that. And this product ownership takes a lot of education, takes a lot of that. But now coming to this doing, yeah, so and uh, how to make it really in this big scale is uh, actually now is uh, we're still on this journey. Uh, but uh, that is for me, I still think most critical because the legacy is sometimes not really the systems, like the legacy is the organization. And then uh, uh, how to transform the entire organization, how we want to do the new business, how we want to really drive it there is I, I think that is one of the key answer to, to your question. So are we there at the final, final stage? Maybe it takes a longer journey yeah? so because it's a lot of re significant reorganizations what you have done. Some people are really get also, yeah, no, it's not an easy task. Yeah? So because then you're always 
um, you know, it's like this when I started uh, my journey with Standard Charter four years ago, my first thing was to educate the board. Um, there is no target architecture because every target architecture with three years or four years prediction will change. And uh, usually when you are going to the CF CFO and all of them, they love to have a target architecture because then they can say, OK, planning, all of that is based on current application landscape, target application landscape. And now we are getting, and this is coming to the point to all of that, in a much more different way. Yeah? So because with the sprint mm -hmm. cycles, with all of that kind of things, um, it's always evolving, always evolving. Yeah, uh, it's a great way to wrap it up. Thank you, Sebastian. I think, um, you know, thinking back to my days in, in technology at Citibank, I mean, it was, I, I had no idea what the products were. And, and I think uh, today that would be impossible. You need to have that touch and you really understand the complete value proposition. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. That was a quick 50 minutes. Um, but I would like to thank the panel, uh, Sebastian, Manish, Nick, Laurent. It was a fantastic conversation. Really enjoyed it. I learned a lot, which is always a good sign from one of these panels. And um, at this point, I'll hand it back to John and for the rest of API days. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.